the role of science in the run-up to COP. Use your knowledge to make clear to governments the full scale of the threat of climate change and the crisis we will unleash if we do not act in time. A waiting game for India. When it does happen, it's likely to then move parallel to the coast and it's quite critical, obviously, as to how close to the coast it actually is. And when rain isn't rain. Another useful test for observers of precipitation and your average three-year-old is puddles. It's Friday the 14th of May and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather brought to you direct from Met Office HQ. Attention is focused on the Arabian Sea right now as all the atmospheric ingredients come together to create ideal conditions for a tropical cyclone. To hear the latest on those conditions and how nearby nations may be affected, I spoke to tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming. There's been a clear indication from the numerical models over the last week or so that the cyclone is likely to develop in the Arabian Sea at some point in the next few days. That's something which does often happen in May because uh, the cyclone season in the northern Indian Ocean is split in two. We have the pre-monsoon period, which is April and May, and then we have the post-monsoon period, which would come around October, November, December. And, and we do get cyclones form in both halves of that split season. Is it the first one of the season? Yes, it is. We haven't had one yet this season, so it's, it's the first of the season. And we expect it to form over the weekend, somewhere just to the west of the southwestern tip of India. And when it does happen, it's likely to then move parallel to the coast. And it's quite critical, obviously, as to how close to the coast it actually is. If it stays well offshore, there may not be any immediate impacts. But if it stays very close to the shore, then we could see some heavy rain moving right up the coast of India from the far south and southwest, right up the west coast towards the, the northwestern parts of India. So we're talking states of Kerala, Goa, Gujarat? Yes, potentially there could be heavy rain right along that zone. And in the longer term, there's a bit more uncertainty as we get towards the middle of next week. And the storm may move out into the ocean, but we do eventually expect a landfall. And that could be over the far northwest of India or it's possibly over Pakistan as well. What impacts are we expecting if that does happen? Well, the models are currently indicating that it could become quite an intense cyclone. The sea surface temperatures in the Arabian Sea are generally very warm anyway, but they are a little bit above average for this time of year. So we could get potentially a very um, strong cyclone as it comes ashore. So we'll have the usual impacts of uh, heavy rain, but the strong winds as well and a storm surge. If that happens, it'll be towards the middle of next week. But uh, of course, that's still some way off. So there's a lot that can change between now and then in terms of precise location of landfall. Julian Hemming, thank you very much. This week, the Met Office hosted the Climate Science Conference, Science for a Resilient Future. The event brought together leading scientists, policymakers and science communicators from around the world. The aim? To establish how climate science and services can be harnessed to build a more sustainable and resilient low-carbon future. Later this year, the UK will host the Climate Summit COP26. COP26 President Alok Sharma took part in the Met Office event, and had these words for scientists working in the field of climate. It is vital that politicians and policymakers like me hear from scientists like you. Whether that is a climate modeler projecting the likelihood of future heat stress and drought, or indeed social scientists understanding the barriers to the uptake of new technologies. It is vital that science is at the heart of international efforts to tackle climate change, and that, of course, we are guided by the evidence. As COP26 president, I'm urging governments and businesses around the world to commit to science-based targets to reach net zero by 2050, to keep the 1.5 degrees within reach. Use your knowledge to make clear to governments the full scale of the threat of climate change and the crisis we will unleash if we do not act in time. COP26 president Alok Sharma. This week's climate conference was presented online, with contributors calling in remotely. More than a few speakers were accompanied by the gentle roll of thunder in the background. So, after a week of heavy rain and storms, how are conditions set for the next few days? Here with the details, Alex Deacon. Anyone hoping for some fine and settled weather? 
or indeed anything a little warmer, going to be disappointed. At the moment, we've got a south shifted jet stream. So the jet stream is to the south of the UK, which means we're on the cool side and we're just going to continue to see showers this weekend. Now, it will be showers, so it will be hit and miss. It's not going to rain all weekend. There will be some sunny spells and actually probably not too many showers across parts of Scotland where uh, much of the weekend will be dry. But elsewhere, expect heavy showers, thunderstorms with hail and lightning are again uh, on the cards too. Temperature wise, well, in between the downpours, if the sun pops out, we could see highs of 15, 16 degrees inland, but some, some coasts will be quite a bit chilly, especially again those North Sea coasts. Sunday's a similar story. We've got low pressure nearby and we'll again watch heavy showers breaking out. Again, parts of Scotland could stay dry and particularly the far northwest may well stay dry and bright throughout. But elsewhere, you'll be dodging those heavy, slow moving downpours on Sunday. So some places getting a real soaking. And again, temperatures mostly in the low teens at best. So below average for the time of year. No sign of that jet stream shifting anytime soon. So it stays showery well into next week. Thanks, Alex. Well, over the last week, rain has affected most parts of the UK. While some have escaped torrential downpours, few have escaped entirely. But how do you differentiate between light rain and that very British phenomenon, drizzle? Here with a guide, Helen Roberts. With the Atlantic Ocean to the west and prevailing westerly winds, it's no surprise that the UK's climate is relatively moist. Rain is the result of atmospheric water vapour condensing into droplets, which we all know then fall from the sky. To become rain, the water droplets must grow in size and the difference between rain and drizzle is all down to the size of those droplets. Formation. Drizzle generally falls from stratus that is fairly close to the ground, while rain forms in higher and thicker clouds especially where ice particles can aid the formation of large droplets. Both types begin as almost perfect spheres. This is because microscopic molecules of water are attracted to each other in a process known as cohesion. As molecules move inward, tension across the outer surface forces the water into a sphere. Droplets collide and coalesce with others and begin to fall, forming ever larger drops. Large drops fall faster than small ones, acquiring more and more droplets of water as they go. Shape As falling droplets grow in size, air resistance begins to reshape them. The bottom of a droplet greater than 2 mm in diameter will start to flatten. Droplets with diameters over 4.5 mm morph even further and air resistance may eventually split them into smaller droplets size. The size of droplets ultimately determines whether precipitation is described as rain or drizzle. Drizzle droplets are smaller, half a millimetre or less, while rain droplets are larger, typically around two millimetres or more. Observation. At ground level, the difference between rain and drizzle can be hard to spot. If you can feel the droplets, even small or very light ones, then this is rain. If you're getting wet but can't actually feel the drops, then this indicates drizzle. Another useful test for observers of precipitation and your average three-year-old is puddles. Any sign of splashes means rain, no splashes, but still feeling rather wet and you're probably experiencing drizzle. Just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. The weather extremes for last week are as follows. These were observed between Monday the 3rd of May and Sunday the 9th of May. From a subdued start, daytime maximum temperatures gradually rose for much of the UK during the week, notably in East Anglia. 22.5 Celsius was recorded on Sunday at Santon Downham in Suffolk. Colder weather continued in Scotland, including some snow in the central belt for election day on Thursday. Many overnight air frosts were recorded. The lowest measured temperature was minus 5.9 Celsius at Kinbrace in the Highlands. The highest recorded sunshine of the week was 14.1 hours at Morecambe in Lancashire on Wednesday. Western Hills had some large rainfall totals during the week. The highest in a single day 
was 52.2 millimetres on Saturday at the Brecon Beacons National Park Visitors Centre at Libanus in Powys. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.